Hello. Hi. Um, we have um, uh, Kaswa uh, Peters. He's um, a data engineer at um, Itemba Labs. He is going to uh, give his talk. So let's welcome Kaswa. Thanks. Thanks, Ronald. Uh, hi, everybody. So actually, not a not a data engineer, a data acquisition engineer. So that's a little bit different. So I'm not a data engineer, uh, not a data scientist, not even necessarily a, a Python expert, but I work at a, at a particle accelerator facility, so we have a lot of data. Uh, and what I think is a fairly unique set of data, so that's sort of me, what I'm going to be telling you guys about today. Unfortunately, I have to go through quite a lot of background, so I'll try to tell you what exactly our facility is, and then what exactly the types of experiments it is that we do at our facility, so there will be a, uh, a little bit of a physics lesson coming, but hopefully uh, everybody follows along. So I'm at Timber Labs. We're down in Cape Town. We are part of the National Research Foundation, which makes us a, a national facility. Our money comes from uh, the Department of Science and Innovation, as it is now, it's a core grant. We're a multidisciplinary lab. We have a couple of departments. The focus is on nuclear physics, materials research, and within materials research, there is a branch called ion beam analysis, and that is the data that I will be showing you guys today. So that's what I'm involved in. This is iron-solid interactions using a, an accelerator. We also have a nuclear medicine department, and then we produce radionuclides that we sell to the, to the medical fraternity. At our facility, we have two particle accelerators. We have a, a, a big one, what I call a big one, a separated sector cyclotron that accelerates, beams up to 200 mega electron volt, which is a physics unit that you guys probably have either never heard or uh, really hear. And then the particle accelerator that is used for the type of research that we do that I have the data for today, which is a 300 million volt tandotron. That is an electric static accelerator. So just a little bit on the separated sector cyclotron. That is a machine that's been there since the, since the mid-80s. And as I said, that is a, we accelerate protons up to a maximum energy of about 200 mega electron volts. That's a weird unit. That's a physics unit. i just give you sort of conversion factors there to see how it maps to like real world units. It's a bit of a mind-bending thing. That machine is used for, for research and training. At any time, we have a number of interns in science and engineering fields. Uh, we have master students and we have PhD students coming through there. That's sort of part of the mandate of the facility. Uh, and that, ma that particular machine is used for nuclear and accelerator physics, and that is also the machine that is used to produce our, our radionuclides. But that is not the machine that I'll be talking about today. That's a picture of it, though. Uh, I couldn't find one that gave you a nice idea of, of the scale, but there's a walkway around there, and that rail is at about sort of waist high for a, for a human, so you'll you can kind of get an idea of what this machine is. Um, the one that produces the data that I have today, though, is a electrostatic accelerator. It's a tendotron. It is something that is very similar to the Van Graaff generator that you, you would have experienced at school. As a matter of fact, the machine that it replaced was called the Van Graaff accelerator. Uh, we've had this for only a few years now, shipped from high voltage engineering, so they, they came this came out in parts on a big ship, and they uh, installed it, as I say, a couple of years ago. And what that gives us is primarily two types of particle beams that we accelerate, protons and alpha particles. So alpha particles, if you, don't, uh, if you can't remember what that is, pretty much just two, pr two protons, two neutrons, so a helium atom with the, with the electrons stripped away. Uh, so that's the accelerated beam that we use for our experiments. We do those experiments on two beam lines. There is a, what we call a micro beam line and a broad beam line. The micro beam line called that because the size of the beam spot that we have there is on the order of microns, typically a micron on a good day. We would like to get it down to sort of nano sizes, in which case we would have a nano beam, but we're trying to get there. We're still learning what we can do with this machine. And then on our second beam line, we do experiments with broad beams. So this is typically alpha particles, so heavier particles, and that beam is, is millimeters wide, so that is what we would call a broad beam. So those are the types of beams that we do our experiments with. 
That's a picture of the beam lines on the left is the, is the broad beam line. Uh, you can see a, an end station there where the experiments happen. That is the micro beam line, and there's another end station there. I have a better picture of that beam line uh, a little bit later in the presentation. And all of that stuff happens in vacuum. So there are pumps that, that, and valves and things that create, our accelerate department creates the vacuum for us to do our experiments in. Um, so what do we do with, with, uh, with those instruments? That is a closer picture of the instrument that we use on the microbeam line. It's called a nuclear microprobe, a scanning nuclear microprobe to be exact. Uh, and that is a, uh, as I said, on the broad beam line, um, a experimental chamber that we use primarily for experiments that do Rutherford backscattering. And I unfortunately now have to sort of try and explain to you what these particular things are. Uh, that's important for you to make sense of the data that I'll be showing you in a bit. So what we have is an incident particle beam, either protons or alpha particles. The stuff I'll be showing to you today is primarily coming from two types of reactions. So there is a uh, particle-induced X-ray emission, um, which for... So we have a sample that we put in the beam line. The sample is made up of, of course, lots of elements. When we shoot our proton beam at it, we get this type of reaction, particle-induced X-ray emission. So we get a bunch of X-rays coming off. And each one of those X-rays, when we look at the energy, tells us uh, what element is in our sample. So all the elements that are in the sample, are the information is exposed to us by looking at the X-rays and mapping those energies to, to what we know the mass of the, of the element is. So you shoot the beam in, you get an X-ray out, you look at what the energy is, and you know what the element in that particular sample is, or the elements in that sample is. That's, that's the one. The other one, very similar, except instead of having an X-ray that gets emitted off the reaction, you have a, and for this one we use mostly alpha particles, so there you have a elastic collision with the atom, and you have backscattered particles. So you count the backscattered particles, and in a similar way, when you do your, your math for conservation of energy, etc you know what the element is that your particle collided with. So these two things, particle-induced X-ray emission and Rutherford backscattering. And when you look at the data that you acquire through your acquisition system, you know what the elements are in your sample. And that is what we do with these techniques, figuring out what samples are made of, the elemental composition of those things. Uh, so you have a, a physical thing happening. You have a, you have a particle hitting a sensor, or in our case a detector, uh, you do some transformation on the signal and you do the thing that everybody I think understands acquisition to be is you turn your an analog value of voltage into a digital value and then you go and store that somewhere on a PC in some binary format in our case. So this is data acquisition, this is what I do every day, building systems to take physical events, these uh, X-ray spectra, all backscattered, um, and ultimately turn that into a bunch of digital values that we then store. That's just, I mean, this is the business of acquisition. You're reading out ADCs, you have some counters, and you're collecting things like charge. You have to store that data, and then of course you have to visualize it. Just a little bit on the techniques themselves, because again, this is important for the, for the data that I'll be showing you. A close-up on that machine, the nuclear microprobe, this is a thing that comes from a company called Oxford Microbeams, and as I was saying, what we are mostly doing here is looking at these characteristic X-rays. Tells us what the elemental composition is of the materials. It's very often uh, biological material because the difference between an instrument like this and, for instance, doing chemistry is that it's non-destructive. And the other nice thing about this proton beam that we s that we have to do our uh, X-ray counting is that it's a scanning nuclear microprobe. So you typically scan in a raster pattern over your sample. Uh, and that's how we do it. Our, our maximum raster scan size is 256 by 256 pixels. That's the raster pattern, of course. Uh, the, the size of the area that we scan for our samples is, is at maximum. This depends on the energy of the beam, but sort of typically for the types of work that we do, it's about, two, okay, there should be a squared there but it's about two and a half by two and a half uh, millimeters. And 
in our rostering, so now you have these defined pixels where you scan across your sample, and you sort of linger or dwell on a particular point for, in our case, time. You could do it for charge. You could count the number of particles, and once you've reached a, a certain point, move on to the next point. But in our case, we just do it by time, so we have an FPGA that sits there for 10 milliseconds, and that's a typical value. We can go down to microseconds, but we do 10, and then on to the next pixel. So you're sitting there, scanning a sample in what is usually a square, and you're just counting all of these x-rays while storing the uh, scan coordinate positions as well. So what you end up with in your data is every single energy of every x-ray, well, not every x-ray, most of them, uh, and then a scan, scan coordinate. That's what we do with particle-induced x-ray emission. We also have, as I said, uh, backscattering spectrometry. So this is alpha particles come back scattered, they tell you again, uh, elemental composition. And the difference between this technique, for instance, and Pixie is that it also gives you some idea of where in the sample your elements are. So you have some depth information that you get with, with this technique. And a novel thing we do at Timber Labs is that um, we do thermal annealing of metal silicide. So we not only put a sample in and count every backscattered particle, which is the most common application, but we also sort of look at the formation of metal silicides uh, while we're acquiring the data. So this is a real-time thing. We put the sample in an oven, heat it up from room temperature to about 600 degrees Celsius, and then you see what happens to the sample. So you have a, a metal thin film that you deposit on silicon substrate, and you heat it up, and it anneals, and then you can sort of see what happens to the sample as the silicides form. So that's, that's, that's the kind of stuff we do. Um, those are two applications. This is another application of the backscattered particles. This is a thing called channeling. When you have a crystalline material like silicon, you have a, a, a crystal lattice, sort of a highly ordered thing. And if you've ever seen this thing, that's the best kind of picture I could find of it. When you shoot backscattered particles at it, Depending on the orientation of your sample, you are either going to have a lot of particles coming back at you, or when you hit a particular channel in the lattice, that yield will drop. So we put that sample on a three-axis goniometer. So we have three degrees of freedom, and then we just sort of move the thing. So we rotate it through some dimension, and then we just see what the yield of the backscattered particles are. So when it's at an angle where you're hitting a lot of atoms, of course, the yield is high. And then when you hit a channel, the yield drops. And what that tells you, of course, is that you, you have this highly ordered lattice, but if there is an impurity, if there is damage in the crystal, you have an atom where it doesn't belong. So instead of having lots of backscattered and then a, a dip, and then more backscattered, you'll see something like a spike in the yield when you, when you hit uh, some impurity in your, in your crystal lattice. So that is, the, that is the physics that we do. So we take energy, energy spectra. Um, and we store that data. And traditionally, we've stored that data with a analysis framework called ROOT. So this is a thing that primarily lives inside of high energy physics. But uh, so this is the type of stuff that they do at CERN. This was developed at CERN. But it's generally applicable. And this is the tool of choice for uh, storing your data. So this determines data storage formats and then also visualizing it when you're making histograms, one dimensional, two dimensional. And this is what we've used for the longest time. So our data gets stored in this format. But recently, we've tried to m move with the times. Instead of relying on these physics-specific tools, why not use something that sort of takes us more in line with what people in the industry are using, right? So if you have a tool that more people can code for, you potentially have more people that can contribute to the work that you're doing. And that brings us to Python. Traditionally, root stuff is written in C++. But what we have is a thing called PyRoot. So when you compile root, you have this nice extension that will allow you to basically a wrapper around your root object. So now, all our traditional physics data, we can just pull it, we can just pull it straight into, uh, into Python and, and work with it in that way. So you have PyRoot, and you have Python. So what are, you gonna, what are you gonna use to visualize this stuff? And what we've settled on is Plotly. So of course, you can use JavaScript and R. We are using Python in our case. JavaScript, I think, wants sort of JSON structures for our visualization, but in Python, you can either do use dictionaries or what we are going to use, which is what Plotly calls graphing objects. 
So that's, of course, a very nice interactive way of, uh, of plotting our data. It's browser-based, so you can save this stuff to an HTML file, but what we typically end up doing is just uh, doing the stuff inside of Jupyter Notebook, so there's support for that. And that gives you a very nice idea as your experiment is running uh, of just yeah, what's actually going on. So this brings me to the uh, Jupyter Notebook part. So hopefully you follow to some extent and, uh, and have an idea of what the data is supposed to be for the experiments that we, that we run. So our first is, uh, let's see, where am I? So yeah, it's as simple as at the top there, import root and import plot least graph objects, piece of cake, and then you have access to all of your data that you, you took in root. Um, and the very first thing I want to do is for the type of experiment where we have a X-ray spectrum, so this is the particle-induced X-ray emission, the nuclear microprobe, is simply visualize all of those X-ray events. And that is just, a, a, in my case, a simple scatter plot. For some reason, Plotly does this thing. I have to, uh, okay. Not a lot of resolution to work with. <laughs> I need a mouse. Now oh, this is inconvenient. Can I get a mouse? I don't have enough space here. Yeah, I just, I just, I just want to grab the mouse right now. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, there we go. All right, so everybody see that kind of? I need to maximize this. I think. Thank you. Okay, let's see. All right, so there you go, a scatter plot, and that is a that is a typical pixie spectrum, um, easily plotted. So each one of those as I was saying, that you have characteristic x-rays for, for each element. So each one of those spikes, each one of those peaks in the spectrum tells you that there is a particular element in the sample present there. So this is, of course, a nice, easy scatter plot, a way to do it. But you can see these little, these little bumps elsewhere in the spectrum. And so how you expose those things, of course, is simply changing uh, a property in Plotly um, to change the y-axis from linear to log, and hopefully if everything works all right. I'll have to reset the axis again. You can now see these things exposed a little bit better. So the smaller bumps much more visible now, and each one of those peaks represents an element inside of our spectrum with a nice big one over there. So changing the, changing the scale of the, of the axis from linear to log logarithmic uh, reveals that nice and easily. So now you can, if you only look at the spectrum over a particular part, and you combine that data with the scanning data. So you know that you stepped from one point to another. You've built up this entire spectrum. And you say that you're interested in a picture, but you only want a picture for a particular element. So you set an energy gate over only that region. So you think you have silicon there, and you say, only increment your map for energies within some particular range there. So you now you can identify these elements individually based on those individual peaks, and then you can plot that uh, in, in two dimensions combined with your, with your uh, scanning coordinates. So we pull it out for one element, let's say sulfur, and we plot that in two dimensions, and in initially I did it in a heat map. So now what we should see is for our sample, which in this case was a biological seed sample, is a two-dimensional plot, so you can see what the, what the whole thing looked like, and then the intensities for only sulfur in this case. Uh, let's reset. So there's our, 
a seed. You can't see a lot of detail there. This is the default color scale, I think. No, that's electric color scale. So there's not a, not a lot of detail that comes through there, but you can see that there is a part of your sample that has a lot of sulfur sitting there. This is a little bit more than intensity because we do some calculations in the background that actually gives us concentration. But that's a nice uh, heat map. We can change our color scale. Uh, I played around with a couple of them, trying to find something that exposes the, just sort of intuitively gives you a better idea of where your elements are in your sample. So that's a different color scale that I think reveals this stuff a little bit better. Um, did I do another one? I guess I did another one. Not great. So now we have all of these peaks. That was sulfur. Let's pull out a, a different, maybe a little bit more interesting one. So let's look at what potassium looks like when you isolate the, isolate the that particular signal that way and plot it in two dimensions. Now you can see a little bit more of the structure of this particular seed. This is where all the calcium deposit is. So you have your predefined color scales, but you can also set a custom scale, which is what I did here. And if you play around with that enough, you think. I think you get maybe even a better idea of, uh, of where, your, where your trace elements sit within your sample. So that's, I think, a pretty nice picture of this particular seed sample. And as I said, this is interactive, so you can do things like just grab a region of, the, grab a re grab a region of your sample and sort of zoom in and get an idea. The resolution is bad, of course, because the resolution is dependent on our scanning resolution when we're acquiring, so it's 256 by 256, but still. Uh, I, think, I think that's quite nice. Um, that's the particle-induced X-ray emission. The other thing I was describing to you is, is channeling. Um, so this is where, let me just find the right spot here. So this is where you are now counting the backscattered particles for, um, for this particular crystalline material. So you know that you're going to get high yield at some point, low yield at some point. And what we initially do is we move the thing in one dimension. So you're moving your lattice around. You'll see a high yield, and then you should see a dip in the yield, and then you should see the yield go up again if you're moving it only in one dimension. And that is, that is what we see here. Again, a simple scatter plot with markers and lines. And that's the kind of, this is silicon. And that's exactly what you would expect to see when you find a channel. And so we do that a number of times. You, you scan in one dimension, and then you move an increment in the second dimension, and then you scan again fully over one dimension, another increment in the second dimension. So you are effectively doing what you did when you were scanning the particle beam in a raster, but instead of scanning the beam, you are just moving the sample because you have it on a sample stage. Uh, and of course, now we have all of these one-dimensional scans and then all of these two-dimensional stacks, so you can add a trace if you want to see what it looks like at a different spot. So once we've moved 15 degrees in the second, in the second dimension, just to see, sort of try and build up a picture of what that lattice looks like, trying to look for impurities. But now you have all of these one-dimensional images at certain increments that you know, and so of course the next thing you're going to do is plot it in two dimensions. So we stack up our we stack up our images and we look at it from the, we get a view from the top. And I think I made a, let's see what the initial plot is, I can't remember, um, a contour plot. So that's the default contour plot, I can't remember what the color scheme is, but now you can sort of, if you can imagine properly, um, sort of minor channels in the crystal lattice and then one big dip, as you can see from the scale here, where that major channel is. Uh, you can, Let's change the color scale. Did I change the color scale? Uh, see what that looks like. Where is this thing? Oh, okay. So I changed from contour plot to surface plot. I think this, for this particular type of experiment, gives you a pretty nice intuitive idea of, so zoom, of course, all interactive of what that crystal lattice actually is, right? So these are sort of minor features, and then this massive dip in the yield as you find that channel within the lattice. I think surface plots are really nice for this type of, for, for this type of data. Uh, change the color scale, that's not important. You can of course manually change the range, 
Uh, I also played around with, actually no, right, changing range is a thing you're going to do. I'm not going to show you that. So that's channeling. And I think the surface plot there is a very nice way to, to visualize that data. Uh, I have some annealing data as well. So what I described to you here is that you have, again, all of these individual backscattered spectra, but you are now heating it up from room temperature to the 600 degrees that we have, so this thing is in an oven, and you're taking, counting literally every backscattered particle that you have while you are doing that. So you could end up with one big spectrum that has literally every single backscattered particle in it, but that's not going to tell you a heck of a lot. So what you do instead is you divide the spectra up, and the easiest way to do it is by time. So we define uh, a, a, a one backscattered spectrum as all the events that happened within 30 seconds. So you have a temperature controller that you program to ramp up from room temperature to 600, as I said, at a particular rate. And at every 30 seconds, you capture one backscattered spectrum. Yeah, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> uh, I want to show you what the temperature ramp looks like. Again, simple scatter plot. It's not there. This is really not there. Oh, there it is. So that's the temperature ramp. Um, I also want to show you very quickly what one of those uh, Rutherford backscattered spectra looks like. So that's a typical backscattered spectrum. Again, each one of these peaks corresponds to an element. What we have here is a platinum peak, and that's a silicon substrate. So what you should see when you're trying to form a metal silicide is as you heat up, you should see the... Um, the platinum material moving in, moving lower into the into the sample, so you should see it moving into the silicon substrate. So you might expect the yield to drop a little bit, and you might just see it move, so the energy becomes less. So we do an overlap. That's an easy thing. Is that what I did for a later temperature? So that was at room temperature. This is what it looks like at 500 degrees Celsius. So you can sort of see stuff is happening. Um, the yield is now less. The peak has shifted to the left. And then you have a little bump there. So now you have not the stuff that you started with. You have actually transformation in your, uh, in your sample. And again, because we have all of these sliced information over, over, over time, we want to plot that in a more interesting way. So very simply, of course, the nicest way to see that, I think, is a contour plot. So what we have here is the top view of all of those Rutherford backscattered spectra uh, over time or temperature, and you can see a change. You can see the, you can see the formation of the silicides. You can see the intensities get less. You can see the peak shift in one direction, and of course, you can grab the region to sort of zoom in and, and get an idea of what's happening in your sample. It's a contour plot, so you can change the sizes of the contours. Um, you can do some line smoothing. I don't have time, so I'm not going to show you that stuff. And then you can also. Another thing that I like about what Plotly gives me is the ability to, I'm just going to show you the final version of this, is add some interactive elements. So there are drop-down buttons that give me the ability to do things like change my plot right here. So from our surface plot to a heat map. That's not great. As a matter of fact, that's not the right thing. Uh, shoot. How do I see the rest? I can't see the rest. Um, but you can change the types from heat maps to contour plots to surface maps. You can reverse the color scale. You might be able to see that even though the plot's not showing up for some reason. Reverse the color, color scale, and if you have a contour plot, you can decide to hide or show the lines. It's a nice interactive element to what Plotly gives us. And then, of course, you can do, uh, you can create subplots on your, what I call a canvas, because I come from root. This is also not working. So subplots that stay interactive. So there I, there I plotted the surface graph, contours over there, and that's just sort of a snapshot of a particular temperature, and then, again, stays interactive. All right, that's where I'm going to stop. Thanks very much. I'm going to try and leave some room for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kaso. Uh, questions?
Yeah, that was a good talk. Now, my question is, how do you distinguish, you know, this radiation from different elements? We, of course, the energy, you can determine the element. How do you determine that of uh, the impurities? Sorry? The, how do you uh, determine from the energy of the radiation what impurities are in the samples? Well, impurity in that context would just mean uh, the lattice doesn't look like you, you think it would look. So that's, that's just a sort of a displaced uh, atom somewhere. Okay, yeah. E exactly that is what I wanted to know because when you talk about impurities, people may think it's something different, but it could also be an element. Sure, I mean, so, so this would be damage, impurity slash damage, it, it's sort of very contextual. Um, for that particular type of experiment, it literally just means uh, damage to the uh, to the material. It's okay. Yeah. Another question. Thanks, Kazol. It's fascinating stuff. If you, on a typical day, just out of curiosity, what kind of storage requirements do you have? How, how many things do you test a day? At uh, it's not big. <laughs> not um, for for X-ray emission, this is very different to nuclear physics, where you have things like coincidence and you have multiple channels of data. A typical uh, pixie experiment, so on a nuclear microprobe, you would only be looking at uh, emitted X-rays, and that's one channel of data. So, so you have energy, and then you have scan positions, and you have some metadata that you wrap into some format. So for a run that goes six hours, you end up with a, a file that's a couple of gig. Not very big. It's not big data. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, just a matter of curiosity. Um, if you've got silicon and you've got a, a pattern of uh, of uh, platinum on it, are you looking at like uh, semiconductors or, or? Yeah. So, so the application here is microelectronics. It's right. uh, it is how metal silicides form. So you deposit the. I mean, it's. 10 nanometer um, thin, thin metal films Are you on doing top of a substrate. A vacuum? vacuum in vac uh, yeah, yeah uh, the sample preparation I can't really talk about, but the, the process of annealing it when we're taking the data, that happens inside a vacuum, yes. Right, right. Uh, sorry, it's um, more of a curiosity question. Um, something that always intrigued me about the CERN was, um, and of course I could read this out, but uh, how, you know, particles extremely small. How do you isolate the particle to send it through the beam? Uh, is is it a quite a tricky thing to do? How do you end up with a, with how, a how proton get, beam? For yeah, how do you end up with a proton beam? Is it uh, so? Not my area, <laughs> but I but I can I can give you an idea if you want to maybe come find me sure, later. Sure. Th this is this happens on the on the accelerator side, so that's. Sure. That's yeah. outside of the yeah. outside of my realm. Okay. Yeah, I can I can try and explain it to you. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Another curiosity question: Are you doing any tomography on the microprobe? Uh, tom tomography. Like three D imaging. Um. No. No. Um. We only have. So we don't we don't do any. So you mount the sample, you you we only move the sample around in two dimensions. Uh, as a matter of fact, while we're taking data, we don't move the sample around at all. So you have you have the one view of the sample, and then you do a raster scan over the sample. So you really can't build up anything that's that's three dimensional. We just don't have that kind of capability. I don't think anybody does for this type of instrument. Yeah, no, just uh, but look, I was doing this about twenty years ago, but at Shonland. Um, yeah. we, we imaged a seed. It was actually when I saw your seed images, it reminded me. You, know, you worked at Chonland? Yeah, uh, but, yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're part of us now. They're part of Itemba yeah. Labs. Mm. Um, I, I don't know how you would do it in, in, in three... Neil, do you know? <laughs> no. Okay. No, it's... I mean, no, you we, could potentially mm. move the sample stage as well. I don't even know how yeah, you would we, take we that Yeah, we had data, a rotating stage, and I, I just thought, wondered if it got bigger if people did it. I mean, routinely now. Yeah. No, not not for 
not for particle induced x-ray, not for PIXI, but when you have backscattered, when you're looking at backscattered stuff, of course, there you do move the sample stage around, and then you can have like three degrees of, or even more, if you want. Yeah, actually, I How think we were doing transmission. Yeah. Sorry? It was transmission. Oh, STEM. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, sort of the sensor behind and then rotating the sample. Yeah, uh, no, we don't do a lot of it. Oh, okay, thanks. Or any of it. Hello, good talk. I just want to know uh, another uh, another <laughs> just another question of curiosity. Uh, how accurate are these graphs? <laughs> In terms of getting close to what the actual concentration, because these are trace elements you're looking at, right? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> how would you how would you know? Um, you have you have inherent inaccuracy because you have electronics. They have things like dead time. You have pileup. Uh, you don't always know that you're reading out. You, I mean, you can't. You you cannot read out every single one of these events at the rate that it is happening. So there, there's definitely a a rate limit, and you try and compensate for that by what we call dead time correction. Um, so you do some math to try and, and get rid of get rid of that. And but no, I mean, how accurate? I can't put a figure on it. But there's obviously some inaccuracy in there. A lot of this stuff is is simulated, and then you compare the result of the simulation. Uh, just an announcement. Uh, all speakers should um, go for a group photo uh, at the at the back. Uh, you know, past the Microsoft um, exhibit at um, twelve thirty sharp. Cool. Thank you so much, Castle.